I don't think enough education goes into these sort of things because people are too used to a world where if they buy something for one ringgit, they expect it to come out as double or triple. So it doesn't really work that way. Today we have Jalil Rashid back on the show. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. The last time you came, the video had sixty-eight thousand views, and it is still counting. Yeah, so people love you, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. nice to hear that. So you have vast experience in fund management, right? And today we just want to see through your lens on that side of the world, and perhaps it could help the audience to have a better understanding of fund management, and hopefully maybe the next time they want to buy a new unit trust fund or whatever, it gives them a more informed decision and be more confident when they put the money with the fund. Yeah. So let's play a scenario, right? Let's say today, both of us are going to start a new fund management company. Uh, what is the first step that we need to do? Yeah, so you need to identify what your end customers are going to be. Are you going to take money from retail or are you just going to remain with the institutional market? And the licensing regime, assuming that this is something you're going to do in Malaysia, the licensing regime will be different because it will be a lot more stringent if you're taking money from the retail the mass market and I don't know what the distinction level is but I think if you're a qualified investor it's something like 250,000 and above right. um, sophisticated so that, investors sophisticated investors and anything less than that would be deemed retail right so these are typically you know someone who would invest like a thousand two thousand so the regulations are a lot more stringent if you are catering for the retail market because the thinking from the regulators point of view is that we need to protect these retail investors whereas the most sophisticated investors they're a bit more experienced they know what they're getting into they can live with the fact that they may lose some of the money mm. as well right which you can also lose on the retail <laughs> side right but you know it's, it's just a different <coughs> licensing regime so that's one knowing who your customer is going to be so that will determine the licensing then you need to put together a team and I think in the regulations it's quite specific that you need to have a CEO you need to have a compliance officer you need to have a few so the bare minimum you can start with is probably about five or six people that you need to have already now that would also mean that you need to have a certain amount of capital because if you're going to start your company with six employees you got to start paying them Right, you need to have a license and registered office, so that's another cost. So you need to have a bit of that cash to burn for a period of time. This cash to burn is it based on my own projection, or is it a statutory requirement that you need to have a certain amount deposited with? So you need to have a certain amount deposited with the regulators, depending okay. on what kind of license you're you're taking, right? But that cannot be touched as part of your working capital. Your working capital would be to pay whatever running cost that you have. And then, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're given about six months to kind of fulfill all these criteria that you need to fulfill. And after which, once your full license has been given to you, you can start operation, which means you can start soliciting for money. You can go out there and do your fundraising, right? right? But uh, the fundraising period takes time as well. It's not like the moment you get your license, then the next day money comes in. Again, one needs to be prepared that you need to have a sufficient amount of capital to fund the running cost for at least about a year or two before you know you get some sort of money coming in that you can then take the management fees off that in order to kind of pay off for your expenses. Sounds like a expensive capital to start. Huh? It is, it is. You know, people from a simplistic point of view, people say, oh yeah, I'm making money out of other people's capital. So it's very easy business. One is that no matter how experienced you are as a fund manager, it's still very difficult to go out there and start your own, right? Because everything needs to start from scratch. If say you are a successful fund manager in a firm and you had a 30 year track record, and then you leave that firm and start up your own firm, you cannot take that 30-year track record and transfer and say, hey, I yeah, achieved this in right. my 30 years. Because, because the past is the past. The past is the past. Right. And it's a separate company altogether from zero again, right? So whatever that you have built no longer counts. Mm. You need to start. So maybe it's your personal branding which appeals to a particular customer that will come and say, hey, you did so well there. Maybe you might reproduce this again in this new firm. That is what makes it quite difficult. And as well as that, you need to also be very clear what is your niche. Are you going to be a pure uh, single country equity specialist? Or are you going to do regional? Are you going to stick with equities? Or are you going to do a multi-asset or a balanced fund? So there's a lot of those permutations as well. So once the company is set up, we go and solicit some funds to manage in the company. Yeah. How do we separate between the company funds and the client's funds? And say, for example, something happens to the fund management company. Mm. Something happens and the fund management company goes bust. Your fund will not go bust because your fund is ring fenced from the company by way of a trustee. So the trustee is the one that will say, no, 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 you cannot take the money out of this fund 
because the instruction needs to come from a different person. And that's why the management company would have a board of directors who act as a fiduciary duty. And then on top of that, a specific fund will have an investment committee and the investment committee is specific to the fund. So the role of the trustee is very important because they are like a third party who makes sure that the fund is complying with whatever that is being done. The money that is being withdrawn out from the fund is actually being used to buy stocks, for example, is being used to pay the fund expenses and all that. How would a unit trust holder go and redeem the money from the trustee? So that will all be laid out in the prospectus where they will say like, how would the redemption be. Typically, there's a something called a staggered redemption. Say, for example, 80% of the unit holders want to take the money out in the same day and you cannot because the fund is fully invested, right? It doesn't have 80% cash to pay you out. So there will be a staggered period. So that means a certain percentage of people who put their redemption notice first would get their money first, then another second phase, third phase like right. that. So it will be staggered. So the, the redemption request is put like any normal redemption request but in the event that you know there's too many people redeeming then you will get your money back in sequence but long story short is you will get back the money you will get back the money and that's why regulations are very important right that's why how the fund is regulated is very important sometimes it might sound pedantic but you know the regulations are there to kind of protect investors it's also very important for investors to kind of ask who is the trustee of the fund Right, these are questions that don't necessarily get asked. You need to ask, what's the trustee of the fund? You need to ask the exact same question. If I were to redeem, what is the redemption sequencing like? And what is the amount of cash that the fund would normally hold? Again, this would be laid out in the prospectus. As a rule of thumb, I'll always keep 10% cash. Some of them say, I'll keep it fully invested. And that's nothing wrong with either because it's just a different investment style. But it's good for investors going in to kind of understand all that, you know, what sort of cash, who are the trustees, how do I redeem my money? And the important thing, what's the investment philosophy of the fund? Because I think a lot of people, especially when it comes to retail, just think that anything that I put in as one ringgit is going to magically become five the next day. It doesn't always become that way, right? And I always say that if a fund is outperforming every single year, that's a red flag. That's a red flag because funds would always have down performance and you should always look at fund performance from a longer period of time. So that means how have they done over a three-year period, five-year period. Maybe over that five years, there's one or two years that they are below the market. But in another two, they are way above the market. So average, they've done much better than the average market. So that is how investors should be looking at as they go into funds. They should be looking at it from that point of view over a longer period of time, not after one month or two months. Within a fund, just now you mentioned, every fund has their own investment committee. Yes. Right. And every fund also has their own fund managers. Yes. What is the relationship between the fund manager and the investment committee? Yeah. Sometimes you can have the same fund manager for multiple funds. So maybe a fund company has four funds and they're all managed by the same fund manager. It's perfectly okay. Uh, but each fund will have its own investment committee. Now the investment committee can be the same composition of people, but they are a separate committee for each fund. So the fund manager is empowered to make decisions within the realm of the prospectors. Okay. So as long as it doesn't go above the prospectus, it's fine. But you know, sometimes the investment committee, depending on how you structure it, would have a say on what stocks can be put into the buy list, right? The yeah. stock universe. The stock universe, right? So the investment committee can approve the stock universe. So it really depends on how the investment committee is structured. Right, whether it's an overly involved investment committee or whether it's to make sure that the quality control and standards is there. Most of the time, it's more of the latter because the fund guidelines is already set out in the prospectus and then the investment committee will be structured in a way just to make sure that the fund manager is doing as what has been promised and also asking questions. Hey, why did you sell this stock when it was on the way down, right? What made you exit this? What made you replace that? So asking those sort of questions in a way, putting that kind of burden of accountability on the fund manager every quarter when the investment committee meets. So every decision is a debate between the fund manager and the investment committee. Not necessarily every day-to-day -day decision, but more strategic decisions, right? More right. strategic decisions. So for example, like, you know, say if it's a regional fund, why has suddenly the fund manager decided to kind of go big on China, for example? Right? So those sort of things are, are discussed, not necessarily about, oh, you know, you increase this stock from 1% to 2% because that's clearly within the, the ambit of the fund managers that is allowed. So you should look at the investment committee as a group of investment professionals that kind of make sure that um, they're, they're kind of making sure they're putting the fund manager on their toes. 
if let's say the stock market suddenly go down by 10%, how can the fund manager make a decision? Does he or she need to go back to the investment committee to ask for approval? The role of the investment committee is very much prescribed, right? You know, there's what they call a terms of reference for the investment committee. So it's very clear what their roles and responsibility and their role is not to run the fund. Because at the end of the day, if the fund underperforms, it's not the investment committee's fault. It is the fund manager's fault. So that's why you need to be very clear who pulls the trigger on the decision, right? So the investment committee really isn't the one that decides because it's unfair to say they decide, but then the accountability falls on the fund manager, right? So it is really the fund manager. The investment committee is there to make sure that they are not going out of the perimeter in what they're doing and also to ask the right questions as well. Okay, so for context, a stock universe is the number of stocks that you put into your radar, so to speak, and Correct. you monitor those stocks Correct. very closely, Correct. right? Yeah. But my question would be, how do you determine what stocks to go into the universe? Yeah, so it depends on, again, the investment philosophy. Everything that you do in a fund management environment goes back to the investment philosophy. What is it exactly you're trying to achieve, right? Again, a red flag is that fund manager changes the investment philosophy all the time. That means you've got no philosophy. A philosophy means like you believe in this, you believe in long-term holding, you believe in quality, and you know also that stocks would fall but good quality will always ride through over a longer period of time. So say, for example, you're a long-term investor and then the market falls by 10%. And your investment philosophy is that I'm going to hold long-term. That is a perfect buying opportunity because you already have, say, 30 stocks in your portfolio. They're all very good quality. You've done a lot of extensive research. And then you're saying, okay, these stocks have fallen, not because the quality has fallen, but because there's been a broad-based market sell-off because of I don't know, interest rate movements in somewhere. So a lot of people are exiting, but it's a good opportunity for me to pick up a stock at 20%, 30% discount. So that is a great topping up opportunity. Long-term investors will always believe in buying more when the market is down. But it's easier said than done because there's that fear that cripples you, right? Oh, you know, everything is falling, right? And that's why these long-term investors typically, when they get money from investors, they make sure that the investors putting money in the fund are also well aligned. They also know that this is what is going to happen, right? And that's why it's very important to ask these questions. Asking a fund manager his investment philosophy is very important. It's not necessarily a question I see a lot of people asking as well. Asking also a fund manager how he or she is incentivized is also very important. If the fund manager puts his own money into the fund, that means he's running that fund as if it's his own fund. So that means you know that you know when the fund falls, it hurts him as well. It hurts the fund manager as well. So that is a perfect alignment. Those are usually very good kind of fund managers because they believe in what they're doing and they're putting their money where their mouth is. How often do fund managers put in their money? Not, not often enough. Not often enough. Not often enough. And, and that's what I would like to see a lot more. So if, there's, if the regulation changes, I would love to see would be that we force more fund managers to put in. Right? It doesn't necessarily need to be in the form that, hey, I need to fork out X amount of cash to put in. It could be that your bonus is given back into units of the fund. Ah, right? For example, you outperform the market by, say, more than 5%. That's the trigger level. That's the waterfall level, right? More than 5%. Okay, then you get your incentive is X $100,000, right? That's given by way of units in the fund. Right. Yeah. So you're incentivizing them through the fund. You know, I think if there's one regulation change I would love to see is that because that would make sure that all the funds in the market are aligned with the investors. Coming back to talk about the stock universe, can you invest in a stock that is not in the universe? I, I think that's more of an internal requirement rather than it is an external flag. So usually what will be done is that the universe will be quite wide. So it's usually when they start off a fund, they say that, okay, my universe is all the number of stocks within this benchmark. Then someone might want to put something which is not in the benchmark, right. wants to buy something off the benchmark, which is also allowed. That may need to go to the investment committee. But usually they, it will be done in a way that will allow greater flexibility to the fund manager to do things quickly to react to market timing. Yeah. yeah. So it is not like, oh, I need to wait for three days or four days or five days for approval. Usually when the fund is launched, the universe is already broad enough for the fund manager to work with. And then progressively, they add new names outside of the benchmark as and when they need. What I ask that question is because sometimes you get a new stock ideas where the stock is going up very quickly. But unfortunately, this stock is not in the universe and the fund manager would really like to include this stock in the portfolio. Yeah. yeah so 
I'm just worried that if the fund manager doesn't have the flexibility to make the decision, the fund may lose out eventually. Yeah, so that's why how you structure the fund and write the prospectus is very important. So prospectus are always written in a very broad-based way to give the maximum flexibility so that you don't lose out on all these opportunities in the market. So it is always written in a broad way that if you are a fund investing in a particular countries, your universe is all the stocks listed in that country. Oh, whether lose, they're, in the, enough, whether yeah. they're in the benchmark or they're not in the benchmark. But then maybe some of the companies will say that, okay, as part of your report to the investment committee, you got to later justify why you're buying something which is outside the benchmark, right? You know, So it comes as a later reporting. So usually the, the prospectus is written and designed in a way to give maximum flexibility. After we build the portfolio, it's not like we're going to buy and sell every day, right? So what's the usual routine like as a fund manager? So you come in, you monitor the news flow and I think the key is not to get overwhelmed by the news flow um, because news can be quite noisy, it can be speculative and good fund managers can separate that out and not let the noise get into the way of their judgment. And you then look at your portfolio and say, okay, you know, this has progressively been going up for the last two months. I think it's overvalued. I might want to take a bit of money off the table. So that, that is the portfolio rejigging that you made. So actually a lot of the work of the fund manager is coming in and reading, right? You know, you're actually reading, consuming news, you're meeting people, doing company visits, doing research, and just kind of validating your own portfolio that you're having in the fund, right? And then over a period of time, you've done the research, you say, okay, this is not looking too good. I'm going to reduce a bit, or this is looking very good. I might want to take an opportunity to make some money off. Yeah, so unlike popular convention that people think, you know, it's not like, you know, you are buying and selling on the minute. Uh, it doesn't work that way. There's actually a lot of uh, news consumption that is taken in and a lot of meetings with uh, companies and prospective companies that you would like to invest in. Maybe you can help me to understand this because I was from the sell side, so I can see my client's flow, right? While my question to you earlier is that, Fund managers don't usually buy and sell very often. But the fact is, I always see the same fund buy and sell the same thing very often. Yeah. So why is that so? So all this goes back into fund managers who are more momentum driven, right? They take very short term positions in counters and then they, they make maximum amount of money out of it. It works for some. It won't always work over a longer period of time because you get into a very speculative game. And at some point, it may not make sense anymore, right? So I'm not a big fan of that. I'm always a fan of fund managers having a clear philosophy and exercising that philosophy properly and doing a lot of good research and knowing the key reasons why stocks move up and down. All of us love talking about Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett and everything, right? But very few of us want to actually go down that discipline route of actually doing that because it's a lot of hard work. And the truth is, if you read and follow what they do, it's actually very simple. They don't buy things they don't understand. They buy things which is mass market appeal. They don't buy niche stuff. They don't buy technologies that they don't understand. They're not into fads. So they buy simple, basic, day-to-day -day things that people always use, won't go out of fashion, and insurance, you know, candy company, you know, beverage company, those sort of things, it'll always be there. So very, very simple, nothing fancy. And sometimes those are the best managers, right? You see some of the best performing funds out there, they're actually quite simple. But it takes a lot of work to kind of stick with that and say, I'm going to hold this on for 10 years, 15 years, and make money out of it. The temptation is just too difficult for a fund manager to manage. It is, it is. Because I think there is always that pressure of short-term performance, right? Uh, which is why I think when anybody launches a fund, it is very important to lay out the expectations that this is a fund that will outperform over a longer period of time, not a short period of time. And it's important to make sure you get your fellow investors on board who are also aligned with that thinking so that there's no undue pressure on the fund manager to kind of uh, make rash short-term decisions. There's a saying that goes, follow the fund manager, not the brand. What do you think? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, not, it's not wrong. Um, I think some fund managers, because they, they have built such a brand of themselves, right? And then they go on uh, there. I think there's a, there's a wisdom to it. But I think one thing that people need to look at is that sometimes when a great fund manager moves on from a well-governed institution to a firm of their own, 
there is an element that a lot of controls may be a bit lax because you are you are the firm, the firm is you. There is a bit of, it's my firm, I can do whatever I want. So sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes the risk element can be compromised. And one needs to be quite careful to make sure that as they follow the person and not the brand, they also need to make sure that they are well protected in terms of risk and everything. I won't name names, but there's a lot of fund managers who have built an awesome brand name who have gone on and have gotten into quite a bit of trouble because the success kind of overtakes them into thinking that I can replicate this again and I can take a lot more risk that I couldn't do in my old place, but I'm now going to take on that risk and that then it fails. But wouldn't they have their own compliance officers to stop them from the fancy things that they try to do? Yes, but say you are a legendary fund manager. The whole world knows you. I doubt your compliance officer will be telling you, no, you're not going to do it. He's going to say, well, I pay your salary. Yes, you are right. That should be the approach. But, you know, you're talking about a business which is run by humans and run by humans who sometimes have a lot of ego. So it's very difficult for some normal person to say no. So that can happen as well. So one needs to be quite careful that, you know, as you follow the person, that right element of controls is always there. As a client, as a customer, would it be a better strategy to diversify my unit trust investment to a few fund managers that I like and at the same time continue to follow a few brands that is very established. I mean, that depends on the person but diversification is always a very good strategy, right? Whether it's across different brands or whether it's across different funds or or it's across different styles or even different asset classes. So diversification is always the best way to go. But I think the key is that people just don't diversify for the sake of diversifying. They're diversifying because they know what they're diversifying on. So if, for example, you're diversifying across asset classes is so that you get something come rain or shine. For example, you invest in a bond. At least you're guaranteed 3.5% every year. Then you invest also in a bit of equity. So on some good years, you can make 10, 20%. But on some, the good years that you don't make that money, it's okay. At least you got bond to at least buffer that, right? Then maybe you got a balance fund as well. A combination of both. You know, you're not going to outbeat the market by, by massive amount, but it gives an air stability. Then there's the simple ones like you do an ETF. You hug the market, but you stick with the large markets of the world. So you kind of hedge your investment across, right? Good times, you're making money. Bad times, you're also making a bit of money. So you're not pocketed out. Then different styles as well. Say you say, I only want to invest in equity. I don't want to invest in fixed income. Then you do different styles. You do a momentum style. You do ETFs. You do a bit of, you know, long-term, short-term funds, right? So there's always that balance that you can that you can get right um so that that's diversification for you right so it's just to make sure that you know you're 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 protected across different different uh things so it's like i i say that you know it's like you choosing to buy something and then you can either go with the branded stuff or the unbranded stuff right you know so it, it, fund management you're buying a product is also like that talking about redemption so uh redemption usually comes when let's say there's a crisis in the market and people got panic and they want to withdraw the money from the funds. Uh, Very often, the funds would not have the kind of cash in hand to actually fulfill those redemptions. From what I understand is that then fund managers will have to sell shares, sell those assets away. But that is going to hurt the performance of the fund, right? Regardless. Um, Is there a way or maybe based on your experience, how do you deal with a large amount of redemption at a short period of time? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast rule about that. That if at the end of the day, if the clients want to redeem the money, it is your obligation to give it back, right? So the only way is to sell. You are selling it on a down market. So yeah, the investor is going to get the cash back, but not necessarily at the, at the price that they that they want. So yeah, that's just the reality of it because there is a requirement that once you put in a redemption notice that you get your money after an X amount of time, right? So what the fund manager can do and say, okay, the period to give back the money is say two weeks. I still have some time. I don't need to panic and do it today. I still have a week because it's T plus three. Right. So, so you time your... You can, you can time it. Assuming you get the timing right. That's the leeway you can do. But you have a period which is quite limited. But that's a big risk, right? Because once the redemption notice is in, they kind of lock in the price already, right? Yeah, correct. So yeah, that you don't have too much of room, which is why I think the level of understanding of how this works needs to be educated better. I don't think enough education goes into these sort of things because people are too used to a world where if they buy something for one ringgit, they expect it to come out 
as double or triple. So it doesn't really work that way. As a retail investor, how do we get to know our fund manager better so that we can make that right decision? Yeah, so th th that is why the roles of the agents are very important. Paying quite a bit of money for agency fees. So that is in your right to be asking this question. So it is the role of these agents to actually put these fund managers actually in front of you. And that is why, you know, you need to demand that these fund managers have more airtime with retail investors by way of a round table. They can't be doing things one on one, obviously, because it's, there's not enough time. But you know, you should demand that you have a bit more of a forum to be asking these questions to the fund managers. When that is done, you should attend it and ask the right questions, right? And I say, uh, why I say all this to ask the right question? Because always the question is, people are always asking speculative questions, which no one has an answer to. Is this going to go up tomorrow? I don't know. If I knew, then I wouldn't be working, right? You know, I'd be just punting my own money. But you need, you need to be asking those sort of hard-hitting questions. Like, you know, are you putting your own money in the fund? At what stage would, do you think that you have lost the patience and tolerance to say, oh no, it's falling too much. It's hit a level where I'm uncomfortable. Mm. Right? You should ask that question. Mm. Where's that comfort level? Can you give two more examples of the right questions to ask? Because those, those two are fantastic questions, but can you give two more at least? Asking about how they go about researching their ideas and what is the capacity of their team. Because obviously, if the fund manager is the only one that comes out with the ideas and executes, it's also a risk. What if the fund manager, something happens to him today and then he's no longer around tomorrow? Key man risk, right? So you should be asking, is it institutionalized in a way that someone can step up and take over mm. and keep that continuity going? All right. Well, great insights from you today, uh, yeah. Jalil. Uh, any last words to our audience? Like I always say, I think uh, ask the right questions when you're investing. Always ask about how the fund managers incentivize, what's the uh, management philosophy of the fund. Always ask who's the trustee. Always ask how the redemption is going to work. And always look at track record over a longer period of time. Fantastic. Thank you. Always nice talking to you. Right. And hopefully I can see you again pretty soon. Thank Thanks you. Ra. All right. See you.